Ireland uh, is dedicated in helping to combat global hunger in some of the most vulnerable societies in the world. The government has recently reaffirmed that this objective is central to our development assistance programme and foreign policy. This degree in international development and food policy is unique then in Ireland with its primary focus on meeting the needs of developing countries. I am informed that during 2011, the Work Placement Programme, which is a fundamental part of this course, brought 36 students to various developing countries for a period of 24 weeks. This opportunity enables the student to experience the realities of poverty and development challenges and to put their learning into practice by making a genuine contribution to the organisations uh, that they are placed with. And we do know uh, that students undertaking this degree have travelled to all parts of the globe. I believe that programmes like this present a remarkable opportunity for any student in terms of their educational and personal development and in terms of developing their sense of civic responsibility uh, as global citizens. So I think first of all just very briefly to say what the degree programme is about. Um, it's a programme that, as you can see, addresses issues of global poverty and inequality, um, hunger and food security, sustainability and, and human rights. And it is really um, equipping students with the skills and knowledge to be able to work effectively uh, in the future to address these global challenges. But the placement in third year is an absolute cornerstone of the programme. Um, it's the opportunity for students really to um, put into practice um, what they have been studying um, in the first two, two, uh, two and a half years. Um, six months, 24 weeks in, in, in a developing country, mostly but not exclusively with Irish NGOs. Um, the NGOs that we've been uh, collaborating with for years that include Trocra, Self-Help Africa, Goethe, the Hope Foundation, Edith Wilkins Foundation, and, and a large number of others. Um, and as has already been mentioned, um, students go to a lot of the program priority countries of Irish aid, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, um, we have had students in Lesotho and Malawi as well, so almost every um, Irish aid program priority country has had um, our students at one stage or another. Uh, we also certainly this year had a large number of people in India, um, in, uh, we've had people in Palestine and uh, various other parts of the world. On behalf of the students, first of all, we welcome everyone and thank you for coming to our fourth year showcase. The title of the showcase, Canvas to Community, from Theory to Practice in International Development, represents students' ability to apply skills learned throughout this course to real-life situations. Placement was a great opportunity for us to step up to new challenges on both a personal and professional level. Many of us were placed in foreign environments where we experienced new cultures, foods and social norms. At a professional level, we were able to make use of and further develop technical skills such as writing, communication and research. Uh, students were placed all around the globe, from rural India to some of the world's largest cities like Nairobi. There was a variety of host organisations targeting a range of development issues um, at different levels. And this is reflected in the structure of the following presentations. They are divided into three broad topics, which encompass all the fields that the students worked in while they were away. The topics are food security, rural livelihoods and environmental sustainability, human rights, migration and marginalisation, and children's rights and education. Hello, I'm Jilla. Uh, I did my work placement at PBNML in India. Uh, they're an Indian, uh, an Indian NGO, and they work on community, community development and mobilisation around natural resource issues. PBNML are based in the semi arid region of Rajasthan, you can see on the map. Um, on the edge of the Tar Desert. Uh, the region is marked by a recurrent drought. The uh, majority of people here are involved in agriculture, directly or indirectly, and uh, it's an extremely rural setting. So we got, we got to spend six months in a, quite a rural, small Indian village. Uh, these are just some of the projects that were ongoing while we were there. Um, on the top left is the construction of a reservoir. Uh, top right is a rooftop rainwater harvesting system, which is conducted in uh, private homes. Um, this allows 10,000 uh, litres of water to be stored for the monsoon, uh, reducing the burden on women for collecting water. Uh, bottom left is a 
sanitary water pump. Uh, this reduces water waste on village streets. And uh, bottom right is random sampling, just to check, check on the progress of uh, grass growth. Uh, this is their, their own watershed system that they've developed themselves called the Chuka system. Uh, each year the monsoon rain falls heavy, or well, when it does fall, and uh, it washes, has a tendency to wash topside away. Uh, this is the most fertile part of the soil. Um, GVNML's water, watershed system um, it, it consists of re rectangular uh, buns to trap the water, as you can see in the bottom right here, uh, gives, it, gives it time to soak into, soak into the ground and prevents washing away of topsoil. And this um, creates fodder for the whole year round for, uh, for harvest and depend on. Women are involved in pretty much all the work, um, whether it's construction of a watershed system, um, daily chores. Uh, and the bottom is just collecting water, which is um, uh, it's a daily chore. So a lot of the work on water conservation, such as the rooftop harvesting systems, these really lessen, lessen the, uh, the, the daily chores of, of women. It's, it's, it is quite important. Uh, these are kind of secondary benefits that you don't necessarily see straight away. In Malawi, I did a lot of death research, and I was sort of at their country head office in the long way for uh, the greater part of that. And I was in the field then at the same time carrying out focus group discussions and learning about the learning about nutrition of people um, more closely in the field. These women are current beneficiaries of South Up Africa. Um, they're part of a goat breeding project, but even though they breed goats, they told me that um, they don't consume meat. Um, so that kind of came across in these focus group discussions. They told me, they described the goats and maybe chickens as, um, they call them walking banks. So essentially, if, if somebody dies or if there's a wedding, then they may slaughter a goat. Or if they need to generate income quite quickly, then that would be when they would slaughter a goat. But it's not that they would eat it every week for their dinner or as a Sunday roast. So in Zambia, I had the privilege of um, taking part with my colleague Tara here. Um, we carried out a pilot project in participatory video. Um, I did further research in the area of nutrition. And then in Uganda, this is where the orange flesh sweet potato is being grown um, quite widely and promoted quite widely. To tell you a bit more about the, this type of sweet potato, um, basically it's sort of, um, it's been biofortified, so biofortification, it's um, a process by which crops are higher in micronutrients, and this is through the means of traditional breeding, but also through modern biotechnology. The white flesh sweet potato doesn't contain a lot of uh, beta carotene, um, which is a precursor to vitamin A in the body. And then the orange flesh sweet potato, it um, is very high in this, and in turn then it's, um, it pre prevents night blindness, which is quite common amongst women in, in developing countries. Um, and also it sort of boosts other immunity. Um, vitamin A deficiency is very problematic in the developing world, um, particularly amongst women and children, and it can lead to um, disease such as children can die from diarrhea because they have very low um, immunity to, to disease. So these photos I took in um, Uganda, and here on the left is, is the orange flesh sweet potato, it's one of the, the NASPAT varieties. Um, and then this is up in the Kayonga district, my colleague Brian um, from South of Africa, he had to help me to facilitate the discussion. Um, and again, thing, I learned things through, you know, from, from local people that I couldn't learn in the literature. Um, in this district of Kayonga, people told me that they had, um, like, the, the farmers that were approached for this project, they currently grow, um, or they had been growing the white flesh sweet potato, but in fact, they're struggling a little bit with the orange flesh sweet potato because um, the yields haven't been as high as their more native varieties, and they're trying to get difficult to keep the vines from one planting season to the next as well. Um, so that's just specific to that small area, um, but it, I suppose it was quite not notable that such variances did exist between all the areas that I did visit as well. So the first part I worked in development education, which is basically um, increasing awareness and understanding of um, global issues with students. So I worked in primary schools, secondary schools and also in third level institutions. So I carried out workshops and and had the opportunity to go to Zambia for two weeks as a kind of taster visit um, with 16 secondary school students. 
and I attended lots of conferences and organised events, which kind of got me a great four days at electric picnic with a stand and a travelling workshop. And then I also carried out um, research into the level of awareness of global issues between secondary school students in Ireland. I was uh, in Tanzania for five months, where I worked with uh, Gotter and Children in Crossfire. Most of my time I spent with Children in Crossfire and uh, uh, Children and uh, on a specific project that was based in uh, the Mohimbe National Hospital. And basically, what this project was uh, was treating kids with cancer. So I, I kind of uh, pitched the idea of designing the database in Access and um, that was accepted and we went off and uh, what I did there was instead of having one massive uh, file, I kind of split them into three. I had a personal uh, detail record, I had a diagnosis record and then a treatment record and I designed a new interface where uh, it was easier then for anyone to make those records. My duty was uh, getting involved with the daily education project this was uh, a very interesting project because usually chemotherapy would last anywhere from six weeks to 18 months and usually the norm is you know you come in to have your chemo treatment and you go back home and come back here for three weeks or four weeks but in Tanzania this is not the case because most of these kids come from very poor background they are traveling from the farthest end of the country to Dar es Salaam so it means that of these families used to actually live on the world sometimes for up to two years and so uh, they thought it was, a good, it was a good idea to set up some kind of a school where hey, the parents would actually have some kind of rest to, for themselves from the hours of nine to half two, half two in, the after, in the afternoon. And as well that the kids could also learn something. I spent my six month work, place, work placement with the Joint Advocacy Initiative in the West Bank of Palestine. Through this, I gained a first hand insight into the life under occupation. The JAI, the organization I was working with, um, works. Uh, engaged with three core campaigns, the Olive Tree campaign, uh, the BDS campaign and international advocacy. The Olive Tree campaign uh, works in assisting farmers whose olive trees have been uprooted by the Israeli military. Since the year 2000, uh, Israeli military and Israeli settlers have uprooted or destroyed over 548,000 olive trees within the West Bank. Many of these olive trees are up to 400 years old. Uh, the olive tree campaign has today replanted over 70,000 of these olive trees. Um, however, many of these replanted olive trees have also been uprooted by the Israeli settlers and military. The uh, BDS campaign is for um, boycott, divestment and sanctions against the State of Israel until it complies with international law and the universal principles of human rights. Today, Israel has been the target of 65 UN resolutions for its continuous nefarious practices against the Palestinian people. The Israeli Defense Force regularly violates the Geneva Convention, a convention that was drafted after the Holocaust and the Second World War to ensure that such atrocities would never again occur. The JAI advocates for Palestinian self-determination through establishing and developing links and partnerships with, with other organizations internationally and disseminating information on Palestinian life under occupation. These pictures here show daily life in Palestine. On the top left hand, you see a Palestinian farmer plowing his land with a horse. Many farmers have lost land since the um, construction of the separation wall between Israel and Palestine, as 85% of it is actually constructed inside the 1967 agreed green line. And my activities with the uh, JAI included um, conducting both primary and secondary research facilitating focus groups with youth groups, conducting one-on-one -on -one interviews, and developing and implementing a survey. From a personal point of view, the situation that uh, had the most impact on me while I was in Palestine is what's currently happening in Hebron. Uh, this picture uh, I took myself in Hebron, and it's from a street just outside the centre. Um, Israeli settlers have occupied the top two floors of the houses on both sides, and the Palestinians must live and work uh, underneath. On a daily basis, uh, Israeli settlers throw household and human waste down onto the Palestinians, and so they've had to erect this mesh to stop this waste from landing on. It is home to 150,000 Palestinians, yet in the last 10 years, 500 illegal Israeli settlers, uh, they're defined as illegal by the International Court of Justice, they have occupied the center of Hebron. 
There are 1,500 Israeli soldiers stationed there to protect them. And families who have lived in the center of Hebron for generations are now moved outside, and those who still live in the center of Hebron are deemed to be living illegally in their own homes. It's really an appreciation for us from Africa uh, of, of the efforts that one, Ireland makes, and two, the student body and, and this institution, to try and um, maybe grapple with the challenges of especially Africa, and to see what role you might play in trying to help us people um, um, find solutions to these challenges. But I hope that you also see the other side of Africa. Because it would be very, very, very sad for you as a community to only really focus on Africa and its challenges. And, and I think this is an opportunity even for yourselves as students when you go out there to see what the other side of Africa has to offer. I think there's a development story there and the progress that Africa has made in so many of these areas that, that would be interesting to look at. And I think Ireland as a country and as a government is also changing the way they look at Africa. And only recently, um, last, no, in September, the Tonish Day with the Minister of uh, Trade and Development uh, launched what they are calling the Africa Strategy at the first Africa Island Economic Forum. And what this is saying is, yes, Africa has challenges, and these challenges will continue to face us, but Africa is actually developing. And distributably, Africa is developing faster than any other continent. And there are very, very, very many opportunities there. And so this is just something that I bring up because um, as we look at Africa, there's an opportunity to also see, even as we face these challenges, how can we deal with these challenges from another angle, not necessarily an aid and uh, sympathy situation, but an opportunity where we can build skills and where we can build partnerships that will assist or ensure that Africa takes the lead in solving its own problems.